the National Health Service, the NHS. It's guaranteed to come up in all of your medical school interviews and it's really important to know about because there's got so many hot topics, whether it be in terms of privatisation, whether it's thinking about financial strain or indeed thinking about low morale as well. All of these are really important to know about. If you guys are new here, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. We hope you enjoy. Okay, so what is the difference between primary and secondary care? Okay, so primary care is the first site of patient contact. Um, it's what we know as being GPs. They're in charge of dealing with acute care and chronic care. And then the secondary care is often when we get referred up to a specialist centre. For example, a cardiology um, specialist clinic. This is important because the more complicated um, and complex cases that might not be able to be dealt with at the primary care level can then be referred up upwards. We then also have tertiary care centres and these are often specialist based centres that have state of the art equipment and experts in specific medical fields. For example, Great Ormond Street Hospital, so a paediatrician where um, a child's case becomes so complex that they need the extra advice and the extra help, they then get referred upwards to the tertiary care centre. Having these um, levels within our healthcare system is really important because it helps us deal with the basic cases quickly and efficiently and helps us maximise our use of resources by working up the levels of care centres to ensure that all problems are dealt with efficiently. So who are the important members of the multidisciplinary team and why? So the multidisciplinary team are a group of healthcare professionals that can work in different settings that all come together to come to the best conclusions for a patient's individual needs. So these can include physiotherapists, radiologists, nurses, psychiatrists, lots of different people from different areas of the healthcare setting that all can give their individualised and personal approach so that we can take the values and the qualities of each of these individual people to give the personalised response to the patient so they can have the most efficient and productive treatment plan. So an example of when I saw a multidisciplinary team working in action was when I was volunteering at the hospital and I saw a stroke patient and this involved lots of different departments coming together such as the speech and language therapist to help assist them in their rehabilitation in gaining of the speech um, the physiotherapists, because often with the stroke patients who have been bed bound for um, long periods of time, they need assistance um, in gaining their strength. Pharmacists can also be really useful because they understand how when there are lots of different drug interactions, the issues that we can have with side effects and to make sure that the most appropriate Drugs and prescriptions are all in check, ready for a patient, particularly when it comes to discharge times, to read through all of the notes and confirm and approve of everything. Why do we need nurses when they cannot prescribe? Nurses play a really important patient-facing role. They're involved in the day-to-day -day observations, such as measuring blood pressure, the heart rate and the respiratory rate of patients in the hospital. They have a lot of patient contact and actually sometimes they form more of a bond with the patients, which allows them to make more observations on how they're feeling, whether they're improving, whether they're declining and needing to pass this information on to the doctors. There are also more specialised nurses, such as in a &E, there are triage nurses that a really important role in ensuring that a &E's run smoothly and deal with priorities and orders and referring them on to the more specialised doctors. There are also more advanced nurses that can in fact prescribe, so their role should definitely not be underestimated. In fact, I think without nurses and without the kind of bridge between the patients and the doctors that the healthcare system really wouldn't be as effective as it is. How should the health service achieve a balance between promoting good health and treating disease? 
So I think promoting good health is a really important step that we need to take into the NHS to limit the amount of um, treatment that is needed by people. These preventative measures are really key, such as the public health campaigns of stop smoking, um, increasing our exercise, making conscious decisions about what we want to eat. All of these lifestyle choices are really important in preventing common diseases that are preventable um, encouraging kind of other lifestyle um, decisions such as avoiding pollution which we know can be factors in certain diseases all of this preventative actions are really important but we can't underestimate the need for treating ill health at that point um, which is obviously the main job of the NHS when we're talking about the GPs in the hospitals. These are people that walk into the clinic that have the ill health. Whilst the preventative measures is important to prevent the strain on the NHS to encourage a healthier lifestyle, which is greater for all, the NHS's functionality is mainly to treat those who are in ill health. Should the healthcare in the UK be privatised? So currently the healthcare system in the UK is run by the government and the public sector. Moving away from this into privatisation, there are two kinds of options that we typically think there could be. One is just the complete move to privatisation, such as examples that we see in the US, where healthcare is paid for either individually or via health um, insurance. And then we also have the other option, which is solely outsourcing certain areas of the health service to private sectors. The pros that we can have from privatisation is that it's often associated with better quality of care because there is more time and there is more money and there is better facilities. However, it does create a two-tiered system if there is complete privatisation because it's only this state-of-the-art facilities are only available to those who can afford it. So that is a real big downside of it. There's also the idea of patients that can really be left behind by privatisation. If a certain medical field or treatment is not deemed as profitable, private companies would have no obligation to treat these patients. And that can mean there's real inequalities within people suffering from diseases, not getting the access to the healthcare that they deserve. So I personally believe that complete privatisation is not the way forwards and that we understand that there is backlog in the NHS and that their services are really being stretched and that the benefit of having privatisation and the more money around it is beneficial but these should only be in like regulated environments where the healthcare inequalities cannot develop. What has put the most strain on the NHS? Okay, so there are lots of strains on the NHS, whether that is backlog in the NHS, issues with beds, issues within communication between the primary care level, the secondary care level and social care settings. And I think all of these link together to the idea of communications in how we deal with things such as an ageing population that is coming through the door. We have more and more people that are needing these healthcare settings. So there is a backlog with the treatments. There are, for example, when I was on my work experience, I saw an elderly man who had a urinary tract infection who was displaying symptoms of delirium and infection. However, there were no bed spaces available for him and he was left in the A&E corridor on a bed trying to be outsourced and you know that causes distress for the patient for the family they're not receiving the direct care that they should be and these are all strains that are being placed on the NHS so I would say that kind of the incoming issue of the aging population is really going to put an even added extra strain on some of the other issues that we're facing. And I'd say in order to try and prevent this added extra strain, we really need to improve our communication between social care settings and secondary care settings. 
because often elderly patients where we're not sure whether it's safe to send them home, whether they are going to be able to look after themselves independently given their condition, they're often not discharged as quickly as possible and that then adds to the issues of backlogging and um, beds occupied. What is the impact of telecommunications on the NHS? What are the pros and the cons? Okay, so telecommunications have been integrated into the NHS quite recently with the impact of COVID and having online calls and video calls often for GP appointments. So they've had a big impact on recent developments of the NHS. Some of the pros from having telecommunications is the ability to often see more patients in a set period of time, you know, quite simple appointments such as um, just clarification over medication, seeing if medication plans are working, things that often do not involve physical examinations. There's been um, a real benefit of this. However, access to telecommunication is not equal throughout all of our society. Obviously, socioeconomic status can really influence on access to telecommunications. Those from lower areas cannot often have the access to video calls and technology that allows this. Again, going back to what we were talking about, physical examinations cannot take place over the phone or via video call. So the importance of face-to-face -face contact with patients shouldn't be lost. Also, some patients do not feel completely comfortable with everything being over the phone and being on video call. There's not the same ability to form a kind of a rapport with the patient. Um, often communication and Wi-Fi issues mean that appointments can become less at ease and for patients particularly with health anxieties this can exacerbate this. So whilst the advantages of having telecommunications of particularly what we've seen in Covid has been really beneficial I think it's important to know that it's not suitable for all patients and that a complete transition to telecommunications would not be suitable for all and that patient face-to-face -face contact is still really important. What are the arguments for and against non-essential surgery being available on the NHS? I think it depends on what we define non-essential surgery as. Non-essential surgery can be defined as cosmetic procedures, but also we can think about some examples of hip transplants, um, etc. that whilst they might not be essential in that moment at a certain point will become essential for somebody's daily living so if we take the example of removal of a non-cancerous mole as a non-essential surgery the pros for the patient is that often people with these they would gain self-confidence they would feel happier um, by their appearance they become more sociable they'd really find it good for their self-esteem however there's no guarantee that removal of this mole would completely cure them of their issues with self-esteem there's also the issue that the NHS there's not a lot of money floating around and that all of these things cost money and it's just stretching what is already a small budget further and further and it's the idea of what can we define a non-essential surgery as and I think it can become quite a slippery slope on who we should allow to have this non-essential surgery and if there are other factors that are causing them to feel a certain way that they are and that they should be addressed first rather than jumping straight to the non-essential surgery. About one in four deaths in the UK is attributed towards some form of cancer, whereas in the Philippines it's more like one in ten. What could be the reasons or factors to underlie this difference? First of all, if you think about what we define some form of cancer of, here in the UK we have very strict post-mortem, we have access to a lot of screening, we have a wider, more established healthcare system versus the Philippines, so reported figures does not necessarily correlate to actual figures, which I think is important that we establish first of all. If we think about the differences between the UK and the Philippines, the Philippines tends to have a lower 
life expectancy in comparison to the UK and we could probably consider cancer as a disease of the ageing if we think the older that people get the more prevalent that the rates of cancer are so the idea that we're living longer so we're bound to have more cancer versus the Philippines and by having these lower life expectancies, there are other diseases and there are other things that are causing the mortalities to begin with. For example, the Philippines is a tropical climate where a lot of infectious diseases are more common versus the UK. So things like that are other causes of death. They also could have very different lifestyle choices versus in the UK. The UK could smoke more, they have a less active lifestyle and we know that these are factors that are associated with cancer versus the Philippines who might live a healthier lifestyle. How does politics influence healthcare and is this inevitable? Okay, so politics is really associated with healthcare, I think. It's undeniable that the impact that politics can have on healthcare, for example, you know, the health secretary, which is employed by the government, which is in charge of the NHS, that's going to have an impact. These each individual healthcare secretaries can have different viewpoints and can make significant changes in the NHS very quickly, depending on their political viewpoint. And if we take, for example, particularly over the last couple of years with COVID and everything, there have been a number of different healthcare secretaries in such a small period of time who all have ranging viewpoints and this can cause a real instability for somebody that can have such an impact on the healthcare setting. This short term viewpoints rather than longer term really means that the NHS can become quite unstable quite quickly. I think it's also important that we recognise that the government's idea with budget, how much budget they associate with their NHS really has an impact. Even separating ourselves away from a direct impacts on the NHS, we have their choices on things such as pollution and their working towards a greener environment. We know that pollution can be associated with disease and that again can link back to the NHS. So I think the impact of politics is really undeniable how far reaching it can be. Okay guys, thanks so much for watching all the way to the end. We hope you found it useful. If you have, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to stay up to date with the latest videos that we create. All right guys, see you in the next video. Bye bye.